Shalom Chavarim, I'm Steve Benun, you're watching Israeli News Live, and I told you guys that Thursday was going to be our surprise guest on, and i always really bad about never telling you guys who it is. I won't tell you why, but one day maybe I'll, I'll tell you guys why I do that. But anyway, John Moore with TheLibertyMan.com is on with us today. Uh, he is listening as, we're, as I'm talking about him here, so we have him on audio, going to bring him on here in just a second. Uh, I do want you guys though to check out John's uh, website, thelibertyman.com. Uh, John, of course, is, he's a former Green Beret, and uh, he has really done a credible job uh, advising. He has a radio broadcast that airs on uh, over there at the republicbroadcasting.org. You can see that. I'll put the links here below for you guys too to be able to listen in to uh, John's program there. Uh, we've actually been there with him already now a couple of weeks in a row there on Tuesdays uh, at uh, 9, 9 a.m. Eastern. Is that right, John? Did I get that right as far that's as... That's right. Nine, nine, 9 to 11 Eastern. That's correct, yes. Exactly. So, you know, John, he's, he's flown 57 combat missions. Uh, you know, he, of course, served in Vietnam. And uh, my dad as well served in Vietnam. John, he has actually shot down uh, twice, I believe it was. Uh, and he served three tours, he said to me, thanks to your grandfather. I guess my grandfather didn't like my dad very well. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so well, wait, get, get the young man out of the house there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but anyway, uh, John brings an extensive amount of uh, knowledge and background, and I had the pleasure of meeting him at the conference there, uh, uh, Paul Begley's conference there up in... Um, uh, that was Ohio, right? Cincinnati, is that where it was, John? I, my brain Since slipped. May the 11th, Cincinnati, Metro Cincinnati, right. Yes. Right. In fact, on John's website, he's actually got uh, the DVD set, uh, if you wanted to order that, uh, where we were at the conference there together. And uh, really, it was a pleasure meeting him. And uh, and I know that we're going to grow a, a, a wonderful relationship as whatever time is left on this earth. And, and John also is a believer uh, that's that's a major to me. Uh, there's so many, so few people, I should say, that are believers that have had a background like John. So you know, because it's a hard life that his this man has been through. So anyway, without any further ado, John, thank you for for joining us here on Israeli News Live today. And uh, I, I would you know talk a little bit about yourself, some of your background, because I know there's I've not covered nowhere near enough of this. And, uh, and and then we're going to get well, into the things it, that are going on. Yeah, it, it, the military stuff was was me as a young man. Uh, I got to Vietnam 15 months after graduating from high school. So I was very young. And uh, I sometimes tell people, I arrived a boy, I left a man. Uh, you can't go through what all was went through there and, and not leave a man, obviously. But uh, most of my adult life, I've been involved in criminal investigations, homicide investigations, a lot of civil work as well. Uh, and uh, during the Tet Offensive there, uh, when I was laying on my belly and, and trying to stay alive, I, uh, something that a lot of foolish young men do, I, I, I attempted to make a deal with God. God, if you let me live through this, I promise I'll spend my life doing something important that has important consequences. I don't know what it will be, but I promise I'll do it. <laughs> so uh, I got through that and uh, uh, got my degree as a paralegal, uh, and I got recruited to be a homicide detective at the age of 25. Um, and uh, it's been quite a life with a, a lot of uh, things I've done along the way. And I've been a radio talk show host since 1995, uh, part-time, and I've been full-time now for, oh, I guess about seven or eight years here at Republic Broadcasting, uh, meeting a lot of interesting people, like uh, guys like you, Steve, uh, in my travels around the country doing these conferences, and waking people up. Um, a concern that you and I both share is that in the not-too-distant future, uh, we, and, and we're, you, it's not you and I alone, but the number of people we work with are all concerned that we may have the commencement of what might be called civil war in this country. Uh, I know myself, I don't, uh, when I first started reading articles seven, eight, nine, ten years ago about a civil war in this country, a new civil war, I thought, well, what a bunch of silliness this is. These writers are about, they, you know, they're writing about they need tinfoil hats because it's just a fantasy, a delusion. Well, I, I no longer feel that way. 
uh, the information I'm getting from confidential sources and some mainstream is very concerning. Uh, for example, it was a mainstream news uh, about a, m a month or six weeks ago that illegal aliens were being apprehended in Texas, arrested in Texas, that had in their possession American police uniforms. Yeah. Now, if, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Uh, these are criminals with bad intent who have in their possession American police uniforms. Now, with a little bit, they wouldn't need a whole lot of training, just a little bit of coaching to uh, be able to look like, act like police officers, which would allow them to walk into uh, the communications headquarters, police headquarters, walk into the government offices, a federal courthouse, whatever it would be, armed, and murder people and destroy equipment, unimpeded, because they look like American police officers. Now, the ones they apprehended, Steve, are just the ones that got caught. And I suspect that uh, for every one they caught, there's probably at least 10 that they did not catch. What do you think? <clears throat> there's no doubt about that, John. You know, the, the border, uh, I was given information back, uh, it's been quite a few years ago when, when they really started having this border issue. And uh, a friend of mine that uh, had a lot of family coming uh, down in Mexico was sharing with me how that uh, they did they, they, they couldn't implicate directly but there was some uh, federal group that was helping to bring uh, even ISIS militants through our southern border and that the uh, the border patrol had been downsized in what they were allowed to carry they couldn't carry their rifles they were limited on the amount of uh, ammunition they could carry in their sidearms and, uh, and and the people were coming in faster than, than they, the, the border control could even handle and so true like you're saying here when you've got a situation where they're coming in with police uniforms uh, most Americans automatically if a person is wearing a police uniform uh, you could you could easily take and, and, and buy a vehicle that looks similar to a police officer's vehicle there, especially since uh, the sheriff's departments, police departments sell these wholesale anyway. Uh, and, and people would think it's a cop pulling them over because nobody thinks to ask, and it's kind of like almost an insult to the police officer anyway to say, uh, could I see your actual identification? In the state of Florida, we had what we called a green card when I was a police officer. Uh, not like the green card that the foreigners carry, but it was just because our, our identification card was a green background. Right. And, uh, but, but no one's there going to ask that, and so you're really putting yourself at risk. Well, I agree. Uh, I, I don't believe that, that these uh, criminals with American police uniforms would do something pedestrian like pull people over on the side of the road. Uh, they're more likely to be engaged in uh, far more... Uh, nefarious acts such as uh, entering a, a critical communication center where they do dispatch for fire police paramedics, a, a courthouse, a government office, a, the state capitol building for example where the, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the state senators, the U.S. and the, the state reps have their offices uh, and so forth uh, and murder people. Uh, it's certainly, you know, we're just speculating here as to what use they may, they may make of American police uniforms. But uh, when, you, when you look like a police officer, you act like a police officer, you can walk around unimpeded uh, with arms and so forth and pretty much go almost anywhere you want. And once you're inside there, you could, if you chose to, of course, you could murder people and destroy equipment, couldn't you? You absolutely could, John. And, and as I shared with you on your program as well, uh, just the other day when I was in DC a number of years back, I, I would have to say about six years ago, uh, I met with one of Obama's uh, Secret Service agents who was actually under President Bush as well and even currently still serves. Um, and he was sharing with me then uh, privately, and I think he, of course, his, his intention was for me to get the message out, but there were plans by the deep state to create a civil war in this nation and of course they wanted it to be a race war so at the time they were using skull to brain technology and he told me he said Steve he said it worked in Tunisia and uh, we got the Arab Spring 
But uh, he said, we tried it here in America, and it didn't work. And he said, uh, some things, he said, some of the events that you see are real. Some of those are fabricated. He said, some of them, when they are real, we, they, they publicize it, hoping that the black community will, will rise up and riot. And he said, the, the ultimate goal is, of course, to disarm the American public, uh, to, to find a reason for it. But his, his very statement was, they're trying to create a civil war in this nation. And that's troubling, John, to hear this from someone that works uh, in the Capitol to, to tell you this. It literally was on the plane with uh, George Bush traveling uh, all through the Middle East and stuff. Well, when you when you work at that level as a Secret Service agent, you're, you, uh, the, the people that you're assigned to protect, you get to know these folks. Uh, there's casual conversation uh, at the water cooler, which is kind of a generic term. But uh, when you're when you're working together every day in the same environment, you're going to hear stuff, and uh, things will be shared confidentially that uh, us uh, pedestrians out here, uh, peons or whatever you want to call us, peasants, would never ever hear. And of course, personal relationships will always trump non-disclosure agreements, won't they? Yes, they will. And, you know, another one I'll add too, John, uh, just for your knowledge, I don't even know if I've even shared this one with you yet. Uh, I was speaking to uh, one friend uh, who's connected with the Mossad in Israel, and he was sharing with me that when the war with Iran goes down, he said it's going to be almost like a domino effect. He said Israel and the Saudis are actually going to take down Iran, whereas he said they want the United States, even though they would help in this war, but they want the United States to keep Russia off their back. And But he, the, what he said to me was really surprising, and I didn't know how to take this, and, and maybe you might have a little bit more insight on this, but he told me that there could be a possible limited uh, nuclear strike on the United States but following that, he said there would be, um, there would actually be a civil unrest due to, uh, you know, society uh, collapsing to some degree, and of course martial law, a run on the stores, and he said they're going to basically allow the Americans to run themselves out of bullets for a few weeks there before an actual uh, ground assault is done in the nation. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I do know one well, thing. Well, we, 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 you and I did talk about that privately, Steve. Okay. And uh, it's a very plausible scenario, very plausible. The uh, Russians are a lot of things, but one thing, one of the things that they are is a country that does not want to waste their soldiers. They like to use proxies and have for many decades. Uh, they don't want. Uh, Russian mothers bugging them because their sons are coming home in body bags. Uh, they don't want that. They want to see other people's sons die, not not Russian sons die. Um, so anything they can do to minimize Russian casualties, they will do that, uh, including using proxies such as you know, MS-13 and other gangs from Central and South America, soldiers from other countries south of our border. Uh, the meeting that took place in Chicago in, uh, a couple of months ago, that was very telling, and, and you and I uh, you know, verified it independently from uh, one another that the meeting did take place. Uh, that we don't know what was discussed, but it's a short list of possibilities. Uh, the type of meeting that would take place maybe six, no more than 12 months before the event. Um, the event being civil war in this country followed by invasion, uh, and it's very. The scenario you laid out is very plausible, a scenario where they allow the uh, United, the American citizens to basically uh, consume each other and use up uh, resources, including ammunition. Uh, I know out here in the Ozarks where I am, Steve, the, these deer hunters, they all have a centerfire rifle that can uh, take out a deer three to five hundred yards away. but. Rarely do they have even 40 rounds of ammunition. Typically, it's one full 20-round box and part of a second 20-round box. That's typically all the ammunition these, these men have. It wouldn't take long to eat up that much ammunition, would it? Not at all, John, especially in any type of uh, uh, scenario where we might be dealing with a Civil War type uh, issue. And in fact, the Israeli intelligence officer that shared this with me the one thing he told me, he said, when you see these things going down, he said, look, the only safe place is going to be way out in the middle of nowhere. Of course, there again, not anybody, not most people could ever do that. You need to have, you need to have a plan 
uh, John, which I know you are really good at knowing about these type things, a plan laid in place, not because few people could ever survive just living in a wilderness to begin with, uh, but, uh, but a logical plan of safety. And, and my thought is, of course, when I say out in the middle of nowhere, you can always, too, have a plan that would include that you've got a, a, a place that's built, a facility or whatever, uh, a home that you've purchased out in the middle of nowhere, because the main thing is to get away from the urban areas. These are the areas exactly. that are going to get taken down first. Exactly, exactly. Well, what I advocate, Steve, and for all our listeners is to become part of somehow, some way, become part of a hobby farm. A hobby farm is a place where the the uh, produce, fruits, vegetables, meat, eggs, uh, milk is meant for consumption by the people that live there. Ideally, enough uh, fruits, vegetables, meat, milk, and, and so forth to uh, sustain everybody that lives there. Now, that's a big deal. Uh, if you just start out uh, on the fifth uh, day of July, 2019, to establish a hobby farm, by uh, oh 2021, you might be raising enough food to feed yourself, and that's optimistic. Uh, getting a hobby farm going is, is no small thing, and having a lot of money helps, but it doesn't speed things up all that much. So, uh, the time to be a part of a hobby farm is it's really pastime. Uh, I would encourage people to. Uh, find a hobby farm that needs uh, two things. All hobby farms basically need two things, uh, labor and money. And if you can find an agreeable situation right now, a hobby farm a, a good distance, 50 plus miles, the farther the better from a major metropolitan area, uh, become part of it somehow, some way. That could be a matter of life and death for your family, couldn't it, Steve? It could, John. And one thing that a lot of people never take into consideration as well, John, and that is uh, when you get seeds, you need to find seeds that are non-hybrid seeds. Uh, genetically modified hybrid seeds, when you grow that crop, you have no way to be able to harvest seeds for a new crop. And unless you have a stockpile of hybrid seeds that would last long enough, uh, that could also pose a problem. So, and they're hard to come by, John. I, I guess you probably know that as well. Finding seeds that are not hybrid are very difficult to come by. Well, you need to know where to look. We have a outfit not far from me, Baker Creek, I think, is the name of the outfit. Um, and uh, let's see, Baker Creek Seeds. I'll get you their website here momentarily. Rareseeds.com is their website. Rareseeds.com. It's a neat place. Uh, they sell heirloom seeds in Mansfield, Missouri. Um, and um, it's just a fun place to go to as well as having your choice of 1,800 varieties. Amazing. Uh, vegetables, vegetables, rare flowers, and herbs. All non-GMO open pollinated seeds for, and heirloom seeds. Uh, so uh, that's a, that's a great place. So uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you need non-GMO heirloom seeds to uh, be able to have uh, uh, you know a continual production of food, where the seeds will actually produce more plants. Um, that's real smart to do, but it takes time. And we're basically we're out, when it comes to establishing a hobby farm, we're out of time. If I was to start one today, I would have at least a two or maybe better a three-year supply of food stored up while I'm, I'm attempting to learn how to become a farmer and have the hobby farm produce enough fruits and vegetables and meat and eggs and so forth uh, for my family to live on. Uh, that's how serious I think this is, Steve. It is. And John, on your website, do you have, uh, let's see, because I know if I go to products on your website, um, I was just looking to see if you had anything like that on there as far as uh, uh, foods and things like that where people could order that. I don't see that. I, I've seen it on... Well, there's, uh, you know, on products I got uh, Simply Clean Foods. It's all uh, organic, uh, long-term storage food. Right. Um, so th that's what's there. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, there's other places, of course, you know, you get the best pricing you can. The, the way to store up the, the most food for the least amount of money, of course, is to buy bulk grain. If you can buy it by the truckload, uh, it goes down to where it's very, very cheap to buy oats. I would, I'm not so sure I'd get wheat in bulk or corn. It'd be hard to find non-GMO wheat or corn, either one. 
but there's, there's oats, barley, spelt, other grains that are more likely to be uh, heritage, non-GMO uh, grains that you can store up in bulk, properly stored, they'll last for decades. And it may be a boring diet, but it'll keep you alive. That's exactly right, because you can always stone grind that yourself, uh, make your own uh, cakes out of it, no matter how primitive it might be. But that's exactly right, John. And, and uh, you know, and, and I think that especially when people have not prepared as far as growing and they've not got in the habit of, of canning and jarring, uh, uh, or in a lot of cases, John, probably a lot of people don't even know how to even begin a process like that. Uh, no. I mean, I grew up uh, on a farm, so I mean, for me, it's second nature, you know, to, in fact, even when it came to tomatoes, we would grow them, but we never, we would go actually to a farm that grew tomatoes in bulk and get bushels of tomatoes, and then we'd actually take blanch and put them in the jars, you know, and then screw the lid half on, put them in the big pot of boiling water on the stove, right. so it'd vacuum suck right. it down, and voila, you had it good to go, but, right. and always had a couple of years supply, like you said, in advance, because, you never know, you might have a crop that fails that year due to very bad weather. And uh, so, yeah, you'd be in a very awkward well, this position. Is the year. This is the year for crop failure. 2019, we will have dramatic less production of grains and other uh, uh, fruits and vegetables for uh, Americans to be eating, which is going to translate into dramatically higher prices. Uh, that, that's this year. Uh, these rains have just been continuous, non-stop rains. The farmers can't get their equipment into the fields, and uh, there's going to be charges leading to um, dramatically higher prices. So just get ready. And I, I expect to see the higher prices as early as the end of this month. John, I, I got a question to ask you. Seeing as we were at this conference, and, and I'll share something with you that I've not shared publicly as of yet there. But we were there with uh, Pastor Paul Beckley. We were talking about Planet X. Um, and the only reason I want to bring this up, just maybe on a short side of this, is because something like that also could have a dramatic impact uh, on people's safety, where they, you know how they're going to be able to have food, things of that nature. There, can you weigh in a little bit of, uh, about that issue? I know that I didn't really plan on talking about that at all, but maybe just a, a little information from your expertise on that. Well. <laughs> When I'm talking to a journalist and uh, uh, who's pretty ignorant of the topic, the journalist will expect me to answer a question that really you need to read about 5,000 pages worth of books to comprehend it, and they expect me to give a two-paragraph answer to an incredibly <laughs> complex issue. That, that, that's, that's journalism. That's most journalism. Maybe, journalism maybe most we should save this in for another broadcast. That might be the better thing to do, because that's a different issue altogether that we could face. Uh, I will throw in something, though, for your knowledge, though, John, uh, that, that was shared with me recently, because after we did that conference there, I spoke with um, uh, a friend of mine in D.C. and uh, very, very high up as far as in the intelligence circle there. And I, just out of the blue, I asked, you know, what do you know about this binary system that a lot of people call Planet X? And, uh, and I, I shared with him, you know, the information that was given to me. And I said, I have no idea who this guy was. I said, I don't know if he was an astronomer, a mathematician, what he was. He gave me this uh, this stick. I looked at it. It was, I mean, it was over my head a million miles. Right. And so he wrote me back and he said to me, he said, Steve, he says, look, he said, all I can tell you is what I know personally. Uh, he says, it's not my expertise. He says, but being that I am where I am, he said, there has been things shared with me. He said, is there a binary system? Yes, there is a binary system. He said the 2023 uh, December date that you spoke about at that conference, he said, is a bit aggressive. Um, he said, but that's not where the real issue is. And he said, and that's not even with those that are in the know are talking about. He said, where the real problem that's coming is the uh, asteroid uh, or uh, the debris field that the Earth is actually now starting to move through. He said, we're already beginning to go through this, uh, this uh, debris field uh, that's a part of this system. And uh, he said, now that, he said, there again, he said, even 2023 is what we're looking at that's coming. He said, that's still a bit aggressive on the date as far as I'm aware of. He said, but I will tell you this, he said, if people have not made preparations already, he said, 
there's not much hope for them at all. I can tell you, so I can tell you now there will be an internal disclosure two weeks before uh, the impact of the, of the big asteroids that will hit the Earth. And he said, and that will put those people that are already in the know, they will be going underground. And he said, as far as public disclosure, you'll be given one to two days only. And he said, I can tell you, Steve, he said survival rate will be very, very low. Oh, yes. So. Oh, yes, especially if there's impacts in the ocean. Uh, ground impacts are devastating, but uh, water impacts is what causes the most death and destruction. Uh, and I agree. And uh, I've... When I was uh, being uh, when I was being asked to, to uh, go to Prague and accept the Prague Peace Prize, the, the sponsor of the Prague Peace Prize asked me a similar question, Steve. She, she she said, John, if you were president and you knew this was coming, would you warn people? So that caused me to think, and and so I told her what I had pondered on that. How initially, uh, 19 years ago, I was very upset when I found out this was real and the government was not going to warn people. But that was 19 years ago. I've since come to the conclusion, Steve, that uh, warning people in advance will cause people who are going to die anyway to suffer and die earlier than they would anyway. Very As true. opposed to holding out to the last minute and letting these people uh, marry, have children, go to work, have a life, and instead of dying and being miserable. Uh, eight or ten years or 19 years sooner than they would anyway. Uh, so it's a tough place to be, this whole warning situation. Um, and I, at this point in time, I would do the same thing that our government's doing and not warn people. Um, the safe havens where people could be safe does not have uh, shelter and food and, and, and potable water for 300 million people. Uh, that place does not exist, and it's not going to exist. Uh, so what's the point of warning people when all it's going to do, do is cause premature uh, disruption, uh, misery, and death? That's all it would do. Unfortunately, that's my conclusion. Yes, and, and, and to kind of um, throw in behind that, I was with one of my former colleagues there when I worked with the federal government there, uh, and we discussed this just recently, and he told me... Uh, he said, Steve, he said, to be quite frank with you, he said, myself, he said, I would rather not worry about trying to survive it. He said, I would rather just be above ground. I don't care when it's going to happen. If it happens, it happens. He said, and the thing is, he said, because look, he said, if I can survive it, he said, let's say, for example, we can go to the mountains and we can find a cave to live in. He said, what's it going to be like on the planet if you do survive it? What's going to be the aftermath? What, you know, the people that do survive, you know, or, or the radiation or whatever. He said, I, I don't want to die a slow death. He said, let it hit. Take me out right then and there. I'm done. And, you know, like, like yourself, John, and, and myself, he's a believer in Yeshua. And, of course, we already know the Bible says, uh, you know, Jesus, it speaks about plainly in the Bible that they're going to hide in the caves and the mountains. And, but when this type of thing happens, they'll cry for the rocks to, to fall upon them. So... Yeah, I think I think maybe it is a better idea just not to even worry about it. Go about your everyday life, and because uh, you're not going to beat it, it's going what's going to happen is going to happen. Well, there's different ways people approach different topics, and uh, typically what I see, Steve, when when people uh, acquire the attitude of uh, I'm not going to prepare, I'll let it take me out. That's a way of cutting off the discussion and bringing the discussion to a conclusion. Uh, and it's very effective at doing that. Personally, from what, from what I know, I think it is a very survivable event. You don't need a, a $100 million shelter. I think if you've got uh, a shelter that's somewhat protected from uh, extreme heat, we're looking at 150 degrees for a better part of a day, probably. Uh, rocks can hit anywhere. And if you're unlucky enough for your shelter to sit by a rock, well, you're not going to make it, obviously, because it would be uh, devastating. But that's, the rocks aren't going to hit everywhere. The rocks are going to hit a few places uh, compared to the size of this country, not many places, quite frankly. Uh, so I think it is survivable if you're in a, a good location at a good elevation and have made some uh, reasonable uh, preparations. Uh, no guarantees. Right. What will it be like afterwards? Uh, it would be an absolute nightmare. 
but uh, the human condition is to attempt to survive you know even a uh, even small insects when you uh, as a child you know you, you may cut one leg off the bug that, that bugs going to struggle to get away and live it's the nature of living things to attempt to continue living um, that's my yeah. instinct as well John I've never been the type uh, you know because I had like when when uh, my old partner said that to me I told him I said well for me, I said, I'd like to be somewhere around Colorado. I said, up in some of these old mine shafts. I said, I think we could pretty much weather out some bad things there. <laughs> you know, but that was just, I was just being uh, facetious with him. But at the same time, you know, especially your background, John, you know, it is survival instinct. And, and, and that's the one side of me that's the exact same way. It's to survive and to make sure that my family survives. So I think the think and in, in, in also in preparation the exact same way to make the preparations uh, as you've spoken about before in time past the, the sea levels rising, etc. Uh, you know, have a plan. Have a plan. Implement the plan. Live the plan. You know, when people do what you and I do, Steve, you always approach John. When's it going to happen? Steve, when's it going to happen? The people asking for a date. They're the ones who do not live a day-to-day -day life of preparedness. That's why they're seeking a date. So their their belief is that they can live their normal life with their normal job, not do anything until they have a date. And once they have that date, then they'll start making preparations. Now, that's a that's a, a recipe for disaster. What do you think? It's absolutely a recipe for disaster, John. Uh, you can't. There's no way. Uh, you know that you can make that preparation you know I had a dream years ago John and I didn't at that time I didn't know anything about the uh, New Madrid fault line I didn't know anything about the seas rising any of those things there and I remember in the dream the one thing that stuck out the most were uh, motorists were coming from the south and I knew for some reason I knew in the dream I was in the state of Tennessee just above Mississippi is where I was at in the dream uh, I don't think that really has any relative uh, point there but I saw the cars coming up from the south and nothing had happened as of yet but I knew they were fleeing some type of disaster and I didn't know what the disaster was and about that time the ground began to quake and the earth was like looked like literally like ocean waves and uh, a friend of mine uh, Steve Pigeon he, he was in the uh, Alaskan earthquake in the 65 I believe, believe it is and 9.5 I guess is what that quake was and he said that's exactly what the ground looks like. He said it looks oh, yeah. like it's a wave. And, that's right. uh, and it, you know, so there, there again, you know, it, it, if you wait to that last minute, you're going to be stuck like the, all these other people. They're trying to flee, but it's too late. There's no place to flee to at that point. Uh, and you'll be caught in that jam. And it just is not going to be a good scenario for you at that point. So, yes, yeah, better to be prepared in advance. Uh, even in the case where we're looking at right now, John, we're more focused right now about the coming civil war here in America uh, or the real possibility of some type of civil unrest in America, if we even call it that. And as a result, you know, you need to have a plan now regardless for that particular, you know, let alone looking at a possibility what comes after the civil unrest here in the United States, what's next. If you've got that plan put in place, uh, you can be protected, your family can be protected uh, for, for each one of these scenarios. So that's, that's, that's really my thought. Uh, John, any, any, more, any more comments you'd like to make? Well, I have a radio show Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 11 Eastern Time, 8 to 10 Central Republic Broadcasting Network. There's a link to my website at thelibertyband.com. It's a live call-in show. We have interesting guests, and it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. You do want to check out John's program as well as his website there. Uh, and very informative. I think, you know, take the, take the time uh, to do that. And uh, John also on his uh, website, uh, let me just see here, go back to the main page here. Um, and uh, John, is there a way for people to support the work you do on your website? Uh Sure. Uh, I don't. I don't take donations. I sell product. Okay. Well, our DVD set from Cincinnati is there. It's got myself, okay. you, Steve, uh, of course, Pastor Begley, and uh, it's a great uh, set of DVDs that will educate you and inform you. So you don't need to make donations. There's interesting products that if you buy those, that will support me. 
Not a problem. John, are you still looking for that uh, TR3 1957 or later model? I, I am, and I got a lead on one. Uh, it's uh, I need a hobby. My first car was a TR3. I managed to live through it as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I think at this point in my life, I'm mature enough to have fun, but uh, not put my life at risk. You so know, uh, I like the fact it, that you said EMP proof, and there's one other well, thing I think is good for it's, that. These things were as simple as a lawnmower. I mean, nothing to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I think another good car as well for EMP purposes, and I don't have one, but I would love to buy one. Is and they're not that expensive actually either. Is an old diesel Mercedes. Uh, you can I've seen them as low as three thousand dollars available in a diesel Mercedes. Uh, of course, it's I've got a parts car, a diesel Mercedes parts car. If you want one for parts, we can talk about it. All right, we'll have to talk about that. So, <laughs> anyway, John, I really appreciate you coming on uh, today, and I know the listeners. Well, thank you, Steve. We'll have to do this, this again. Well. Sounds great. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Uh, blessings to you. I'm Steve Benu with Israeli News Live with John Moore, uh, and have a blessed day and a world of Ain Shalom. There is no peace.